Why are these blue rocks radioactive? It's December, and so I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about the month's most popular birthstone, at least in the United States, blue topaz. And we're going to discuss the interesting reason for this gemstone's beguiling radioactivity. So let's dive right in. Hi folks, Carl Willis here, and what I have is a um, selection of topaz in a color that is known in the trade as London Blue. So if you look at this stuff, you can see that it ranges from a dark, inky, uh, saturated blue color to more of a, a steely gray, and of course it probably depends on just how the light goes through it. But what is truly remarkable about these blue rocks is that they're basically the only consumer product that you can run out and buy that has spent time inside a nuclear reactor. This stuff comes out of the ground clear, and in the process of being irradiated with fast neutrons, it develops the dark London blue color. It's irradiated in small research reactors in places around the world, like the United States, and Brazil, and India, and Thailand, and Poland, and maybe elsewhere. And this is a multi-ton per year, in fact, probably tens of tons per year, uh, business now that didn't exist before about 1980. Basically all of the value in the stone comes from the processing, the, the production of the blue color through radiation. The cleanest, most saturated blue colors in irradiated topaz, such as in the 9400 carat Ostro stone displayed at the Natural History Museum in London, are the result of sequential irradiations. First with fast neutrons, followed by electrons or gamma rays. The exact physical mechanism by which topaz becomes blue when irradiated is complex and has broader applicability in the context of pressing and sometimes sensitive contemporary nuclear material science questions, like what happens to solid state electronics and space radiation environments. Research suggests that the blue color in irradiated topaz is a synergistic response to radiation requiring the production of displacement defects and color centers. Ionizing radiation dose can be said to decorate the defects that either exist naturally or those that are created intentionally by fast neutron bombardment. This would explain why the first attempts to produce blue topaz with accelerators had somewhat spotty results with strong dependence on the origin of the clear topaz feedstock and how many latent displacement defects it presumably came with out of the ground. The very best way to make blue colors in topaz is probably with a nuclear weapon. You've got this combined environment of fast neutrons and gamma rays, and a little bit of heat, all of which are known to be um, important ingredients to getting the very best results with this stuff. So science fair idea, um, if you happen to have a hydrogen bomb sitting around and want to put it to good use, um, creating beautiful jewelry, um, please cut me in on that experiment. I'd love to, uh, love to help out. Returning to the radioactivity of this stuff, um, we know it's a little bit radioactive with the Geiger counter, but we don't know why. We don't know what nuclides are um, contributing to that. So to find out that uh, aspect, we need to take these down to the teaching laboratory at the uh, University of New Mexico, throw them on the high resolution gamma spectrometer, and see what kind of stories uh, this radioactivity tells us in the gamma spectra. So now we're gonna throw this bag of London blue topaz rough uh, from Thailand onto the uh, high resolution gamma spectrometer, the germanium detector and see what kind of gamma energy spectrum we get from it. Should be interesting. Jesus Christ. Look at all those peaks. That's going to keep me real busy. Uh, as you can see, we have a, um, a large number of peaks, and I'm going to have to go through and identify what uh, 
what new clients are responsible for each of those. Most of the peaks in this spectrum come from one nuclide, which is europium-152. So trying to ask the question, how does europium-152 get into topaz? We have to look at some other clues as well. Um, speaking of europium, we also have a little bit of europium-154. Looking for a mechanism, we can see that natural europium is EU-151 and EU-153, and a likely mechanism is neutron addition to those stable nuclides to produce the radioisotopes EU-152 and EU-154. The addition of the neutron simply raises the atomic mass by one unit. The EU-152 that results from this uh, has a half-life of 13 and a half years. The EU-154, a half-life of 8.6 years. And these neutrons, of course, come from the reactor environment in which the topaz has been irradiated. We also have cesium-134 in this sample, contributing a number of large peaks. The cesium has a similar explanation. Looking at the chart of the nuclides, we can see that stable natural cesium is all 133. Addition of a neutron produces cesium-134 with a half-life of 2.1 years. We have cobalt-60, also produced by neutron capture. You can see natural cobalt is entirely cobalt-59. Addition of a neutron gives us cobalt-60 with a half-life of 5.3 years. We can see that tantalum-182 is also present in significant concentrations in this sample. It too has a similar explanation, neutron addition to tantalum-181 in the natural material. Scandium-46 is also present and owes its origin to neutron capture on scandium-45 in the natural sample. Manganese-54 has the largest peak in this Thailand and Blue Topaz sample and a trickier explanation. If we look at the chart of the nuclides, we can see that natural manganese is manganese 55, which is one mass unit higher than manganese 54. So the prior explanation of adding a neutron to the stable isotope doesn't explain the presence of this stuff. The more likely explanation has to do with a neutron capture on iron followed by proton emission. So we have iron 54 present in some small quantity in natural iron add a neutron to it, form a compound nucleus of iron-55, which then emits a proton. And the resulting manganese-54 has a half-life of about a year. So here's the complete bouquet of attributed radionuclide peaks in this Thai London Blue Topaz sample. Looking ahead, let's compare with the Indian material. We can see immediately that the peaks, as well as the continuum on which they ride, uh, are lower, suggesting that this is a lower activity sample. We can see that the peaks are much in the same place as they were in the um, time material, and so that tells us that uh, similar processes have been occurring. So I've gone ahead and labeled all of these peaks where we found them previously, although the peak locations aren't the same, the peak heights are not necessarily the same, and we'll look at that shortly. There is one special peak that is unattributed in this spectrum, and I'll bring the cursor onto the screen. It is right here at 662 keV. So this peak has a very different explanation from anything we've talked about so far. This guy is cesium-137. Looking at the chart of the nuclides again, we can see that natural cesium is entirely cesium-133. We talked about neutron addition producing cesium-134 um, in the earlier sample, but to get all the way to 137 by neutron capture, I'd have to add one, two, three, four neutrons, a very unlikely scenario. So that is not a good explanation for why cesium-137 is here. The better explanation for this stuff is that it is a fission product produced by the splitting in half, roughly, of a uranium or thorium nucleus occurring in the natural topaz when it's irradiated with neutrons. So when this happens, 
the broken pieces of the nucleus um, frequently contain cesium-137 or another mass-137 nucleus that decays into it. And this is one of the long-lived fission products with a half-life of 30 years. So here is the complete attribution of the major peaks in the Indian London Blue Topaz sample, complete with the new addition of the cesium-137. Turning our attention now to the Brazilian sample, we can see that once again most of the peaks and the continuum are lower, so it's a lower activity sample, which could mean it's older, it could also mean it was cleaner. Attributing the peaks we see um, the europium, the cesium-134, manganese-54, cobalt-60, europium-154, and a prominent cesium-137 peak. So we can focus on particular regions of the spectrum and particular nuclides in that spectrum. Here, for instance, is the cesium-134 peak and the cesium-137 peak. Starting out with the tie sample, we see there's very little cesium-137, although there's more of a peak than we uh, noticed earlier. Going ahead and adding the Indian sample, um, obviously it has a lot more cesium-137, but less cesium-134. And then looking at the Brazilian sample, we see that it has prominent cesium-137 presence as well as cesium-134. So we can say that the precursors of these nuclides are different in the different materials. The uranium and thorium that produce the cesium-137 are more prominent in the Indian and Brazilian material. And, uh, of course, the Thai material has a lot of natural cesium that activates by neutron capture. Turning our attention to the manganese and scandium activities, uh, the manganese-54 peak produced by the fast neutron NP reaction on iron and the scandium-46 produced by neutron capture on scandium. Both peaks are prominent in the tie material. In the Indian sample, we have no evidence of scandium-46, but significant amounts of manganese-54. Um, we could say perhaps this is because the Indian sample is older and the shorter-lived scandium has decayed out, but the presence of significant manganese-54 suggests that it's not because of the age sense irradiation, but probably due to the lack of natural scandium in the Indian sample. The Brazilian sample uh, has very little manganese-54 or scandium. Looking now at tantalum and europium activities, we have um, two prominent europium peaks within this energy band of uh, 1000 to 1150 keV, um, and the tantalum-182 peak is also present in the Thai London Blue uh, sample. The Indian material has relatively little, almost none, of the tantalum-182, but prominent europium. And the Brazilian sample has very little of either of these nuclides. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you come away from this video with the idea that blue topaz is really a pretty special material. It's a product of modern nuclear science and technology, and uh, the science there goes beyond just the, the uh, cosmetic properties of making topaz blue in a nuclear reactor, but has bearing on a lot of contemporary issues of great pertinence. So, um, fun, uh, fun little activity, fun introduction to synergistic effects of different types of radiation. And, of course, we found out that blue topaz is radioactive because of how neutrons interact with it in the reactor. We've got simple radiative capture producing beta gamma emitters of a wide variety. We have some um, NP reactions where a proton is ejected. And most interestingly, uh, we actually have a little bit of nuclear fission in our specimens. We could see the fission product cesium-137 in some of these sources. So happy holidays and thank you for watching. Hopefully uh, I'll see you soon in another video.